Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Mocha Jacksonville. Welcome to our new lecture series, Hyperlocal Art History, with our guest speaker, Dr. Scott Brown of the University of North Georgia. Uh, Dr. Brown is a professor of medieval art history. Uh, and this lecture series derived from a course Dr. Brown taught at the university looking at the art history of our region, our city, and uh, our institution, Mocha Jacksonville, which uh, makes it especially timely given that Mocha is currently celebrating its 100th anniversary. So it's sort of the kickoff to our celebrations uh, and a perfect time to look back and re-examine our history. Uh, but we thank you for being here and we go ahead and begin our lecture and please welcome Dr. Scott Brown. Hello, everybody. I'm so pleased to be here. I love to be at MOCA always. I am a medieval art historian, but I'm also on the board here at MOCA, so I get a heavy dose of contemporary art, too. Uh, we're talking today about the history of Jacksonville, what I've been calling the hyperlocal art history of our region, uh, uh, looking very closely at the history of art from a standpoint here in Jacksonville. Believe it or not, we have a very long art history in Jacksonville, and I've been thinking about, along with my students, the things culturally that have happened here over the centuries that put Jacksonville on the map. And I mean that literally and figuratively, because we're going to talk a lot about maps today. <laughs> uh, how many of you are familiar with the Louis Ansbacher collection of maps at the Jacksonville Public Library right next door? So our cousin institution, and we will talk about some of the treasures that are over there, as well as some of the treasures that have been uh, a part of MOCA's history. So uh, we're gonna get a nice dose of contemporary or modern art and uh, of medieval and early modern and historic pictures and perspectives on the first coast. This whole lecture series began in a course I started a year ago with my students at UNF looking at the history of culture uh, in Jacksonville, North Florida, the Southeast. We have a very long history here, and I was partly inspired by the fact that this year is MOCA's 100th anniversary, which is really quite amazing <laughs> for a number of reasons. One, 100 is a nice big round number, but two, that makes MOCA one of the oldest museums in the entire state. In fact, uh, my research with our students last year uncovered what I believe to be, uh, at this point, uh, almost a fact. I'm not, I haven't found any evidence to dispute it. Makes MOCA one of the two oldest museums in the entire country for modern and contemporary art. Because MOCA began 100 years ago as a contemporary art museum, believe it or not. Uh, this is what we discovered, uh, and this, this lecture series comes out of this research we were doing. It's very much my birthday present to MOCA in some ways because they've given so much to me, and they give so much to our community. What I discovered is that 100 years ago, MOCA kicked off as the Jacksonville Fine Arts Society, which was what it was called in its earliest days, its infancy, with an exhibition that took place here in Jacksonville in March of 1924, uh, featuring 80 of the most important cutting edge avant-garde modern uh, artists of the uh, American and European avant-garde. Quite an extraordinary constellation of artworks. It was covered in the press locally, saturation coverage. Everybody who was anybody came through and saw the show. Uh, uh, every day there were updates in the newspaper. And uh, the list of artists who participated is quite extraordinary. It's very clear that the founders of the Jacksonville Fine Arts Society were aiming to put Jacksonville on the map, culturally, so to speak. This was the first museum, the first arts organization, the first permanent cultural organization of any kind in the city of Jacksonville, 1924. Picasso's I Love Eva, a Cubist masterpiece, was one of the pieces that showed here in Jacksonville. I've been in the process of reconstructing the show, and I've got about 60% of the works <laughs> identified and tracked down. They are today in the finest American museum collections, the Whitney, the Smithsonian, the National Gallery. Uh, here's Marsden Hartley's The Arrow, the National Gallery, another piece that showed here in Jacksonville in 1924. 
this is quite an extraordinary history. And for me, it was mind blowing to think of the city of Jacksonville in 1924 coming out to look at Cubist paintings and then talking about it in the newspaper obsessively, which they did for weeks, even months after the exhibition. There was a very real sense in the city of Jacksonville that they had arrived, that they were now on the map culturally. Uh, what's funny though, uh, is that in some very real sense, Jacksonville invented the map. <laughs> Jacksonville has been on the map from the very beginning. Our founders of the Jacksonville Fine Arts Society were an offshoot from the women's uh, club, the women's club of Jacksonville. And uh, uh, it's three artists, all of whom were uh, among other things, landscape painters who were trained at the top universities, top art schools in the country, at Pratt, the Chicago Institute of Fine Art at the Cooper Union and who came back to Jacksonville and painted uh, scenes of here, North Jacksonville, the Oklahoma River. Here's Rose Tharp's view of Pablo Beach. And, and quite a, a beautiful painting that's now in the Vickers collection down at the Harn Museum. These three women were participating in a very long American artistic tradition that in fact goes back to the beginning of America because I think we can make the claim here today that the very first American artist lived and worked in Jacksonville. How many of you have ever heard of uh, Jacques Lemoine de Morgue? <laughs> Quite a few of you, I imagine. This is, a, this is a pretty erudite crowd, I suspect. Jacques Lemoine de Morgue was a French Huguenot uh, settler of Fort Caroline. He was the artist who was sent along at that time to uh, to record and document and to map the lands that the, the Huguenot settlers at Fort Caroline discovered uh, on, on their uh, visit to uh, uh, colonize right here in Jacksonville. Um, how many of you have been out to the, uh, the national uh, uh, park and seen the, the reproduction of the Rebo monument and the, the reproduction of Fort Caroline? This is uh, quite an important site. It's amazing to me how many people who live in Jacksonville actually don't know much about it or, or have never been out there. But it is, in many respects, the beginning of America as we know it. And I think we can say here that Jacques Lemoine de Morgue, who painted watercolors of the landscape and the people and the, the things that he saw, was in some very real sense, the first American artist. His pictures were then engraved by Theodore de Bry and published in 1591. And we have, of course, copies of these in the uh, Ansbacher collection at the Jacksonville uh, Museum, as well as uh, copies at the Fort Caroline Monument as well. The kinds of things that he saw and that he transmitted, though, are, I think, quite fascinating because they participate in the beginning of a tradition that shapes our sense of place in Florida. <laughs> Uh, so the first thing he's interested in is where the French are and what they're seeing. We arrive here at the promontory of Florida, uh, uh, where the, uh, the French make first landfall, and they move on to the River of May, which we, of course, now call the St. John's River. But we retain the name Mayport uh, at the mouth of the river, a little uh, village of Mayport, of course, named after the French naming of the river. They arrived at the River of May, as they called it, on May 1st, at least they claimed to have arrived on May 1st, 1562. And I say claimed because May 1st is a very um, uh, providential day, it's May Day, and it's associated spring and rebirth and providential new beginnings, a very symbolic day then to arrive here on the first coast. Uh, you can see that these images are, although you might not recognize them as such, a little bit like maps. And we're going to talk about mapping tradition. We tend to think of maps as scientific uh, uh, documents that help us to navigate from here to there and that record true information about the world. Uh, but maps have a very different history than we might expect. And they're far more like artworks of every other kind than we might imagine. Maps represent even still today, only what we, uh, what we hope to be true 
and what we believe to be important about the world. Because of course, even the best map leaves out a lot of things. And there's a process of artistic representation and imagination, which underpins every kind of map. So these documents are very much like landscape pictures, but they're also in some sense like maps and they're full of little place names that tell us what the French have called things. The French came through and after they named the River of May, they named everything else they found after something that they were familiar with in France. So all of the other rivers and inlets were named after French rivers. We have the Seine and we have the, the Charente and we have the Garonne and we have the, the, uh, the Gironde and all of these other French bodies of water that the French persisted in, in, in calling after these, uh, uh, these place names for many centuries, even though, of course, the Spanish gave them different names and the English gave them different names. Maps are also thus places of contested meaning and contested history. And that's, of course, still true for us today. But these are, these are quite wonderful pictures, and I'll, I'll show you a, a, a number of these images, which may seem a little redundant, but each one contributes a different perspective on the landscape that the French are encountering. Jacques Le de Morgue also contributed um, what we might call uh, uh, scenes. That is, pictures of people and activities and things that uh, he and the settlers observed, especially among the indigenous Makama, Timucua Indians uh, who uh, they encountered. And the images here, I think, are really important because they're the first pictures of Floridians. And that's actually what they, what Lemoine uh, calls and what de Bray calls the inhabitants of what the French called Florida. They call them Floridians. And so they're and very interesting people. What are Floridians like? Question we're still asking, <laughs> still today. Uh, and in, in Le Mans pictures, Florida is just like the name suggests, a rich and abundant place, a place of flowers. It's incredibly productive. And the Floridians don't want for anything. One of the things that the, the French are struck by initially is that the, uh, uh, the, the Makama are so tall they make the French feel like like uh, short people. And, uh, and that's because apparently they were well fed, they had good nutrition, they grew tall, they were handsome. And uh, we get this sense then from Le Mans pictures that the River of May is a, a, a symbol of the providential region that they've discovered, this land of flowers and abundance. One of the things they are struck by is that nobody cares about private property. Everyone takes their, their food and they deposit it in the public granary. Whatever you need, you come and you take it. The French can't believe this. It's a place where the land is so productive, fruits and animals and all the good things to eat are in plentiful supply. So much so that people have time for holidays and leisure. <laughs> And uh, Le Mans de Morgue makes this picture, which I think is uh, so charming, about a family going out for a picnic on the beach. <laughs> Here they are carrying the fruit basket uh, out of the water <laughs> on their way to an island somewhere, maybe at Anna Maria, I don't know, uh, to go and enjoy the day. Uh, the idea of leisure is almost unknown in Europe at this time, but the idea of a family holiday, I think, is, is wonderfully charming. They have big feasts. And uh, most important, perhaps for Lemoine, uh, the, the, the natives scoop gold and silver out of the waters of the St. John's in baskets because this is a land of such extraordinary riches that all you have to do is just ladle the gold right out of the river. Uh, they, um, you can see the, they're collecting gold in the streams running down from the Appalachian Mountains, <laughs> which we all know, of course, the St. John's does not flow from the Appalachian Mountains. Mm -hmm. But they persisted in believing this for a very, very, very long time. So here we see the French now building their, uh, their fortress on uh, uh, the island where Fort Caroline was presumably located. This looks like a good place to settle down, they said. Uh, so when I say literally and figuratively putting Jacksonville on the map, I mean it quite literally and figuratively. Uh, Jacques Le Monde de Morgue and Theodore de Bray quite literally put Jacksonville on the map. Here we have 1591, a map, one of the earliest maps of Florida, with all of the French place names and with our River of May flowing down from the Appalachian Mountains. 
from the mountains which are labeled Montes Appalachi and Quibus Aurum Argentum et uh, Alferento, which means the Appalachian Mountains from which gold and silver are refined and flow down uh, through the river down to this port where the French have settled. And uh, the French could just imagine themselves just scooping that gold out of the river and sending it back. Great fortunes to be made. We have been on the map for a very long time. Uh, and yet, uh, you know, uh, perhaps culturally in the city of Jacksonville, we're still engaged in the debate of when we're going to arrive, <laughs> you know, when we're going to be noticed. Maps, mapping, cultural place, our sense of our cultural place is, is always, of course, an ongoing and a generational question and discussion, one that goes back a long way. Now, the map that Lemoine and, and Debray created is a map that was part of a transformation in the way that people saw the world, the way that people represented the world through maps and through representations, images, artworks, uh, like the ones that Lamont was producing. Only a hundred years earlier, the vision of the world that we find in maps was radically different. Uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of a map lesson in history that is, uh, I think, quite fascinating and, and largely forgotten today. How many of you would recognize this as a map of the world? Has anyone ever heard of a TO map? This is what the world looked like right up until the discovery, quote unquote, discovery of the new world. Until that point in time, uh, people represented three continents. There were three known continents, Europe, Africa, and Asia. And they were represented in this way here, inscribed within a circle, a globe, as it were, divided into three land masses, separated by the Mediterranean and uh, this uh, other body of water, which cuts across the Mediterranean, including the Black Sea and the Nile and the Red Sea, uh, which are bodies of water that create these divisions between Europe, Africa, and Asia. And so you can see here, Asia on top, Europe and Africa on the bottom. This TO map was very persistent and uh, it represents uh, a lot of ideas about the distribution of the peoples of the world, usually the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth are associated each one with a continent, uh, Japheth with Europe and uh, Ham with uh, Africa and uh, Shem with Asia. This image of the tripartite TO world is very familiar to us from a symbol known as the Globus Cruciger, which you see in a lot of Renaissance paintings. This is Christ holding in his hands the globe of the world. And there is a cross on top. This is the Cruciger, cruciform part. But then you can see this hemisphere and then subdivided on the top, this half hemisphere. And that represents the division of the globe into Africa, Europe, and Asia on the bottom. But a strange thing happens, of course, in the course of the 16th century. People have to make sense of the discovery of an entirely new continent. And you can see here from around 1500, about a decade after uh, uh, the European uh, encounter with the New World, we see that the Globus Cruciger has been replaced by an Orbus Mundi that is geographic, where we can see the continents beginning to take shape. They're wrestling with how to make sense of the world. Now they have, uh, it makes in some sense, perfect sense to them that the world is four continents and not five, not three, because they have a long tradition, an alternate theory of the shape of the world that goes back to the sixth, seventh century, uh, in which people believed that there were three continents, Africa, uh, Europe, Asia, and then a fourth unknown continent called Terra Incognita, unknown land. And why did they think this? They believed this because you can see here another map where there's over here, this little strip of land, Terra Incognita. Why did they believe this? Because they thought of everything in terms of fours, not threes. Threes didn't really make sense to them. There are four cardinal directions. There should be four continents. There are four, uh, four elements. <laughs> uh, there should be four continents. There are four uh, humors in medicine and medieval medicine. And they thought of things in fours. And so in some sense, it made perfect sense to them that out there somewhere waiting to be discovered was this unknown fourth continent. 
And, and, and this is, goes back to this point I made earlier that maps represent what we believe to be true, what we hope to be true, and what we believe to be important about the world. So even though no one had any evidence for the existence of fourth continent, they were already making maps that anticipate the discovery uh, of the quote unquote new world. So here we see a tripartite map from the 16th century where this guy's playing with how to represent it. We have the three still hanging together. And at the center of that world is Jerusalem. This is, this is a reminder of the way that we use maps to represent what we believe to be important. Jerusalem is the center of the universe in this case. But hanging off here to the left, we see for one of the first times in the history of map making, this little lump called America, die neue Welt. <laughs> It's not long before we get much more descriptive, much more modern looking maps of the world. But in some sense, they haven't changed that much. They're still representing people's expectations, their hopes, their beliefs in certain concepts of importance. This is a map which we would recognize today as very much like a modern scientific map based on surveying and engineering. But it's still full of representations that encode our expectations of the world. Here is Europe, and uh, Europe is identified by this woman with a cornucopia, a giant fruitful basket, and all of these symbols of arts and science and intellectual attainment are all attributed to Europe, to her invention, right? In the background, then, is a war that's happening between different warring factions. So Europe is this warring country, this warring land of uh, opposing ideologies, but nevertheless is a land of abundance and fruitfulness. And you can see, most importantly, Europe has her footwear on the globe. And it's that old T.O. globe. <laughs> it's the old medieval globe based on the three continents. She has dominion in this map over the earth. She is not alone here. On the other side is Asia, who is a familiar uh, old friend, as it were. And Asia has strange, unusual, different animals, uh, but it also still has warring peoples. It's a land of, of armies. And here is Asia herself personified as something like a cross between a Byzantine princess and an Ottoman uh, uh, emperor. Uh, and she holds in her hand a Byzantine thurible for sensing the incense in the, the Greek Orthodox uh, uh, church incense and in the other hand a pepper tree pepper spices these were all things that were associated with asia and with the east and, and in her feet she has a box of jewels so it's a land of riches a land of wealth it's where they were trying to get to when columbus stumbled into uh uh, uh the caribbean and down below now we see these uh new lands including africa which is an old land but it gets lumped in down here on the bottom with the new lands. Here's Magellanica, which probably a lot of people have not heard of, but it was a, an unknown, a yet unknown supercontinent that we might associate with Australia today. Uh, they, it was sort of a theoretical idea. Uh, and But on the other side, we see Mexico and Peru. And the objects that are in this space are quite fascinating. Some of these engravings, these images are actually based on the engravings of Florida by de Bray. And, and Lamour, and Lamour de Bourg, because uh, that was what people had to work with at this time. This book of, of engravings by uh, de Bray was so influential, shaped international and scientific and intellectual views of America for centuries after it was produced, right on down to the 20th century, in fact. It was influential through the 20th century because anthropologists in American universities used his engravings to reconstruct falsely in many cases, uh, the, 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 the history of native culture and, and cultural practices in pre-Columbian America. But we can see here, Mexico and Peru, they have cacao beans <laughs> in their boxes. And there are all these wonderful exotic fruits and animals. And one of the most interesting things about these scenes down on the bottom is, no one is fighting with anyone, which represents, I think here, a hopeful expectation, also an article of belief that there was no one to put up any fight. This was a, a Pacific culture waiting in some sense to be, to be taken over. 
uh, by the powers that be in the world with armies and steel and weapons. Maps had been used from the Middle Ages through the Renaissance down to the present to represent the expectations that people have of the world. And before the discovery of the, uh, uh, of the New World, here this is a map from just around the moment that uh, Columbus is sailing, 1493, right? So it doesn't yet represent any knowledge from Columbus's journey. They were already producing this. But it's a, a map from a, a very important book called the Nuremberg Chronicle. And it represents the world as known then at that moment in time, a fairly modern scientific looking map. But off here on the side are these funny little pictures, almost caricatures that represent the medieval concept of the, the what we call the monstrous races, the people who live in terra incognita, in the unknown land out there somewhere, who knows what we will discover, but they imagined it will be strange. It will be wondrous. It will be marvelous. There will be men with six arms. Why not? <laughs> there will be people who don't wear clothes because they grow hair all over their bodies and don't need them. There will be giants and centaurs, and there will be people with six eyes and three faces. Again, why not? <laughs> Maps are a space of imagination, which seems strange, but the act of abstracting the real world, the world as we experience it, and imagining it in this strange flat schematic, that is a powerful act of imagination. We're always using our imagination when we're thinking about maps. Here's one of our early uh, maps again that's next door in the Ansbacher collection, uh, which represents uh, the uh, new world known as Parias, a very, very early, even before they began to use the word uh, America, uh, Parias is a place name Columbus gives to uh, uh, a part of the, the new world. Down here we see Terra Nova, New World, New Land, and the representations of the things that have been discovered in this new land. They're picking up here on the tradition of the monstrous races by representing what they think they have discovered. These are cannibals. And we can see little arms and feet and legs that have been dismembered and are going to be eaten. And right next to this is a fearsome beast. There's a Latin inscription next to it that tells us about this fearsome beast. It's a terrifying creature that keeps its young in a pouch and it nurses them on the blood of its, its own body. It's their take on a possum. <laughs> Would you recognize it? Has anybody ever seen a snarling possum? They look pretty fearsome. I'll be honest. We have plenty of possums around here, though. We can go verify later. Uh, you know, so maybe in every map, there's a little hint of truth. <laughs> but there's also this, this expectation that what we're showing here is true. This, this hope that these things are true, this belief that they are important. Sir Walter Raleigh, a figure who's still quite important to us culturally, probably North Carolina, right? A major city. And uh, Sir Walter Raleigh, this is the map he sends back of Guiana. Quite a good map, uh, full of lots of useful information about places and rivers and systems. And also a reminder of the kinds of people that you will find in Guiana when you go visit. There are the naked women. Uh, who are they? Amazons, <laughs> the Amazon, right? That's where we are. So what would you expect to find? Amazons and their male counterparts are these figures who don't have heads. They have their faces in their chests. They are called blemii and they go back to Greek antiquity. Blemii were described in travel accounts and narratives from the ancient world. And people believed in them just like they believed in, in uh, centaurs or, or, or sirens or uh, you know, uh, cyclopses, right? Out there somewhere, you'll find them. Uh, and in fact, in Sir Walter Raleigh's written uh, description of Guiana, he has illustrations of a Blemioi camp that he has visited. <laughs> yeah, you wonder, uh, how is this possible? Well, we're capable of all kinds of all kinds of confusion in human society. Uh, we haven't grown out of it a bit, I think, here in the 21st century. There's plenty of space for, um, uh, what do we call it, fake news uh, these days. 
Uh, here we are, though, back to back to the floor, back to our, our main theme. Uh, this is another of these great maps from the Ansbacher collection next door, 1552. And this is one of the first times that we find the place named Florida. Where is Florida? It's the whole continent. <laughs> so when I say Florida is central to the cultural history uh, of, the, of America, believe me, it is. <laughs> We've been on the map. We made the map. Uh, it's kind of amazing. This is Terra Florida. And you can see there are plenty of mountains in Florida. <laughs> We'd be surprised to learn today. But they were laboring under the assumption that these Appalachian Mountains were, were the crucial source point for the minerals that they wanted to come and harvest. And uh, there's Terra Florida. Um, and this is, uh, this is a marvelous, charming map that uh, uh, from the same same period, a, a modern map made according to the best scientific information available, according to the best cartographic skills, placed inside the hood of a fool or jester uh, with this great inscription, uh, Stultorum infinitus est numerus, the number of fools is infinite. And there's a wonderful commentary there. Well, what do we think we know? And when we think we know something, what do we really know? Uh, uh, this, is a, this is a great image as a skeptical image in the history of knowledge and of art. Uh, maps were tremendously important objects in this period. And these new maps were collected. Uh, in fact, the Ansbacher collection is a part of that tradition of valuing these maps as not just as sources of information, but as, as aesthetic objects. They were beautiful. They were very costly to make and produce. And we get a sense of that from looking at Renaissance art. Johannes Vermeer is one of the best examples. He puts maps in the backgrounds of so many of his pictures. And they remind us of another layer, the function of maps and of map making. Here is uh, Vermeer's woman reading a letter, 1664, with the map as the backdrop. The letter came from outside. Here she is inside the map figures this idea of the outside world, of the person at some distance who has sent this, this letter to her. The map is a symbol of alienation. Whenever we're looking at a map, we're not where we're seeing, where we're looking. We're not where we're imagining through this schematic representation. Uh, when, we, uh, when we look at a map like this, it's a reminder of that alienation, but also that desire, that, that imagination of place. We see this in this very wonderful uh, Vermeer picture, the ironic geographer. The geographer is in his study. The map is on the wall in the back. He's got his compass out and he's working on the map, but he keeps getting distracted because he's looking out the window. <laughs> Two very different ways of seeing the world. And uh, one of them much more organic, one of them perhaps even much more satisfying than the other. And perhaps the most vexing instance is his allegory of painting, the art of painting, in which he places on the back wall behind the subject, shadowing the figure of the artist at the easel, this great map. Art and maps, and map making and place making, culture, these things all sort of intertwine in our story today. I'm not trying to draw a direct line from uh, uh, Le Moine, but... Uh, uh, I think we can get our, our way back to the 20th century here if we try. Um, here we are in the 17th century. We're 100 years into now this knowledge of Florida. Uh, the Fort Caroline community came and went very rapidly. But Le Mans book, through his, his images through the DeBry's book, are still circulating. This is a map which 100 years later is still perpetuating some of these ideas that are rooted in that much earlier hopeful vision of uh, Florida as the land of gold and silver. There are the mountains. I love Canada's right on top of Florida. <laughs> How do you get to Canada? Just drive north. <laughs> it's just over the border. Here are the mountains, and here's the lake which feeds the River of May, and it's still coming down to our port. Well into the 17th century, even into the 18th century, Florida was almost synonymous with the entire eastern half of the, of the modern United States. 
Uh, we can see, for instance, here is a map of Florida and the Appalachian, right? And Florida, which begins over here somewhere in the center of Texas, <laughs> continues all the way to the coast. Uh, here, uh, another image from the late 17th century, where the French are still trying to perpetuate this idea of their ownership of this whole broad, vast region. And that's one of the parts of our, our story here locally that's so fascinating to me, the, the cultural transformation and the cultural exchange that happens right here in our little region, which is uh, indigenous and Spanish and French and English and French again and Spanish again and then English again and then American. <laughs> There's a lot of history that unfolds right here in this space, which is central to our, our sense of the history of the entire uh, uh, history of America. Here, even in 1728, uh, a map from Herman Mole, which I love the, the caption of the map, Florida called by ye French, Louisiana. <laughs> uh, 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 strange to think of the conflation of those two things, but that wasn't that long ago, at least for me. I, I'm a person who thinks about the very distant past. So when you say 1728, it's like, that was yesterday. <laughs> Jumping forward to the, to the present, though, to the modern period. Here we are in 1879. How much has changed? How much has changed? I, I, don't, I don't think that much in many respects. Do we have a more perhaps scientifically determined surveyed landscape in Florida? Yes, we have a smaller Florida, certainly. We're no longer claiming Texas. <laughs> Maybe we should revisit that issue. Uh, uh, it, and we have a, a landscape which you know charts according to our geographic, scientific, mathematical knowledge of the shape of the world. But we also have this abstract layer of information, which again encodes what we hope to be true and what we believe to be important about the world. And I'm particularly interested in one of the great 19th century projects in Florida, which was platting the entire state, a huge human technical bureaucratic scientific endeavor, sending out survey crews in the vast unexplored wilderness of Florida to produce survey lines in order to overlay the geographic map with this regular rational grid of lines that indicate property, or at least the potential for property. Now that's imaginary. <laughs> that's an abstraction. It has nothing to do with the shape of the world. It has to do with the shape of our culture. And I also love that we have this image in 1879, Florida stops here. There's nothing down there. <laughs> on the bottom, at least nothing that they thought important enough to put on the map, right? So back to the map, back to our place on the map. Jacksonville has had a number of things over its history that has put it on the map. And uh, Fort Caroline was one, certainly. Uh, and uh, one of the things that we have been remembered for is that book, uh, right on down to the present. In 1870, 1860, Florida began to be discovered as a beach and wintertime resort destination for people from cold climes. I wouldn't encourage them to come here today, a day like today. It's just like, you know, every time we host the Super Bowl, the weather is terrible, right? It's cold out there today. But generally speaking, we have lovely weather in the wintertime. And in the 1870s, uh, Florida began to be marketed nationally as a wintertime destination. Harper's uh, Weekly, actually this is Scribner's, which was a major monthly magazine, sent the artist Thomas Moran, one of the great American artists of the 19th century, uh, one of the artists of the, uh, uh, the Hudson River School, sent him down on assignment to make pictures of the landscape to illustrate an essay which was just about selling Florida as a wintertime beach destination called An Island in the Sea. Uh, it's a, it's a lo lovely little essay with these beautiful etchings that depict iconic Florida beach scenes. They're some of the first Florida beach scenes that I know of. 
And that rapidly begins to be what people expect to see. Thomas Morant hung around for a while and he made other pictures. In fact, he got this great idea based on the history that we have here. He thought, I'll make a few pictures about American history based in Florida. And so he painted Ponce de Leon uh, landing and, and uh, encountering uh, the Floridians, uh, the indigenous people. And he, um, he had grand visions for this. He was going to sell this to the US government for $20,000, huge sum of money. And so he gave it to the House of Representatives on long-term loan, hoping they would fall in love with it and not want to part with it, right? And he set it up there. It got a very mixed reception. The main complaint was there weren't enough palm trees. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not joking. This is, this is true. It hung there for a while, and some of the guys from up north grumped and groaned about it, and they said, yeah, it doesn't look like Florida. <laughs> it's supposed to have more palm trees. And so it failed, and it, the painting went away, and it circulated here and there, and was sold over into Oklahoma, and came back to the Kummer uh, Museum, our, our sister institution, the Kummer Museum of Art and Gardens. Many of you probably know this painting. It's an iconic piece of Florida and local regional history. So Thomas Moran wanted to put us on the map. Imagine if this painting were hanging in the US House of Representatives today. Maybe we'd have a little different perspective on Florida's place in American history. Instead, they bought a painting of California from Albert Bierstadt, uh, another great painter of the 19th century. So California gets to be the, the, the big story up there. It's too bad. Henry Flagler put us on the map. Uh, the Ponce de Leon Hotel, the hotels in Jacksonville, which we don't remember because they all burned down, uh, uh, the other Flagler uh, resorts. Um, and, but look how he does it here. I love this advertisement from Harper's Weekly, uh, turn of the century, our own Riviera. <laughs> There's a geographic mapping reference to another place. Come here, it's like that other place. <laughs> I don't know. It's not necessarily a good strategy for us in Florida if we sell ourselves by pretending we're someplace, well, a secondhand version of someplace else. <laughs> we try to put ourselves on the map. Uh, I don't know how many of you have ever heard of the Florida Subtropical Exposition, but uh, the, the town's fathers of uh, the, the town, the leaders of the city of Jacksonville in 1887, they got this big idea. Well, they'll build a huge pavilion in a really cool architectural style and we'll invite people from all over the world and we'll host a huge fair and everybody from the world will come. And the president came, this is Harper's Weekly recording, the president's visit, he, they put us on the map. Sadly, that same year, the yellow fever epidemic began the month after the exposition closed. And unfortunately, that also put us on the map. <laughs> Nobody wanted to come to Jacksonville for a while. Then we had the Great Fire, 1901. That put us on the map. In fact, uh, some of the most fascinating national dialogue about Jacksonville relates to the fire. And I don't know how many of you have read the great uh, uh, newspaper reporting by H.L. Mencken uh, that, uh, that is dedicated to, uh, to the, the Great Fire, but it's some of the best, most interesting reporting and memoiring that is, uh, that's connected to uh, the city of Jacksonville. So maybe we have some dark and some sad things in our history. But 100 years ago, uh, MoCA. I think that's something that we ought to be aware of and that we ought to celebrate. We ought to take the time to remember. It is 100 years of effort by people in the city of Jacksonville to, to carry this institution, to shape it, to keep it going, to nourish it with their effort, to not let it fade away, not let it disappear. Uh, there's a hundred years of people who have contributed enormously to the city of Jacksonville and to MOCA and to the city of Jacksonville through MOCA. And I wanna take the opportunity here and in my lectures to come about 1924 and the foundation of the Jacksonville Fine Arts Society to recognize that and to say thank you to all of you who support the museum. And I hope will support us for another 100 years. So I'd be happy to take questions, but that is the end of my remarks for today. And I thank you all so much for coming out. Yes. I don't have a question, but I just 
when you're going through all those maps, up until the 1700s, every river flowed from north to south. Even the St. John's was up in the north and coming down. They, they couldn't imagine that the river would flow north. They couldn't. They couldn't. But this is, how, how could that possibly uh, be true? Florida couldn't possibly be flat enough for that to happen because there's all those mountains. <laughs> yes. Yes, the chief city of Florida. Well, how many of you know this? this is, I think this is an important uh, fact and one that we often uh, don't think about. Uh, uh, I, I've lived here for 20 years. I'm not a native Jacksonvillian. I'm, I'm from far, far, far away, Macon, Georgia. Uh, 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 but at any rate, I have discovered Jacksonville over the course of my life. The first time I came here, I was uh, 14. I was on an academic bowl trip. We came down to Jacksonville. What I remember is they took us to the landing, which had just opened. It was introduced to us as the future of American urban land use. <laughs> <laughs> well, at any rate, uh, um, God, God rest the landing. Uh, at any rate, we, um, uh, I've lived here long enough, though, to uh, to have a sense of what Jacksonville knows and what it doesn't know about itself. Jacksonville is the largest city in Florida and has been. It's the metropolis of Florida, its entire history. And uh, it is central to the identity of the state and central to the history of the state. Uh, now, some of that has to do, of course, with consolidation in uh, the 1960s which expanded the city uh, political boundaries of Jacksonville from the historical city to the county, which brought a huge population into the, uh, the, the nominal city of Jacksonville and raised our population above smaller political city entities like Miami and, and Fort Lauderdale, Orlando, and things like this. Um, uh, but Jacksonville has been for every decade, but one in the 20th century, the largest city in the state of Florida. And it was the metropolis of Florida uh, uh, right on through the 1920s and 30s and 40s. It's not until the, the, uh, the, the 40s that the population in the major cities in South Florida begins to compete with the city of Jacksonville. Uh, so it's no wonder that uh, we, we started some important things here. Um, uh, but it is an interesting question I always ask myself, why did it take so long? It's actually the topic of my next talk. We'd been a big city for a long time. It was 60, 70 years of being a major city before we finally got our first cultural institution, Mocha Jacksonville. Yeah. No, so uh, uh, I, I do not, uh, not on me. Uh, of course, Jacksonville, Mocha has had many names and many places uh, over its history. And uh, it, its early years, it was closely intertwined with the Women's Club of Jacksonville. Uh, the founders were all members of the Women's Club. In fact, the entire concept of the Jacksonville Fine Arts Society was a product of the Women's Club of Jacksonville. And uh, they were very much uh, twin partner uh, organizations for the first decades. Uh, so, uh, but then when we moved to Jam and and Art Museum Drive, of course, there are there are, there are lots of images of the museum there. Yes. Who's the driver in New York City to select the artists and work on the logistics? And so I will talk to you. Uh, that's going to be the topic of one of my next talks. But uh, a little preview: this extraordinary person who no one here has ever heard of, a woman named Mary Dell Hoyt. Uh, who was uh, uh, the leader of the art committee of the Women's Club of Jacksonville for like a decade and a half. Not a native Jacksonvillian, but she and her husband lived here for many years in Ortega and owned the entire property at Pirates Point, uh, which is uh, has been subdivided many times, but out there on the river in Ortega. And, and um, Ortega, I don't know. I still don't know how people pronounce it. Yeah, you can tell I'm not from there. Uh, and the uh, Mary Del Hoyt was this extraordinary figure who would not give up on Jacksonville investing in a cultural life. 
Uh, and she mounted a series of quite extraordinary exhibitions, which I'll tell you more about, but it was her. She was the driving force and she was the person who knew the people and she was the person who got the rest of the city behind the project. They, they established uh, what was called, at the same time as the Jacksonville Fine Art Society, they established something called the Art Exhibit Fund, which is the earliest historical precursor to the Cultural Council of Jacksonville. And that was an organization that was funded by the citizens of Jacksonville at the time, not by the municipality, but it was funded solely for the purpose, like the Cultural Council, of, of giving money to cultural institutions to produce and to share and to create public art ex exhibitions. And that's the organization that actually funded it. Yes. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much. This has been a delight. Very glad to be with you. <laughs>